Hi everyone, welcome to Lecture 10b of Useful Genetics, where we're going to continue our discussion of polyploidy, this time focusing mainly on plants. Polyploid plants can be large and very vigorous and robust. We'll talk about how this polyploidy can arise both artificially and naturally, about the issues raised by the infertility of triploids. So here's um, tetraploid grapes compared to diploid grapes. You can see they're a lot bigger. Probably the big fat grapes that you buy in the supermarkets are in fact polyploid. The fact that cells are much larger when they're polyploid in plants may partially explain why plants tolerate polyploidy much better than animals do. It may be that the larger cells minimize the differences in protein concentration that would otherwise be a consequence of polyploidy and that could disrupt the balance of gene regulation. Here's strawberries. This is my favorite example of polyploidy in plants. Um, at the bottom left are diploid wild wood strawberries. The next picture is of what's labeled as named different species but it is a tetraploid strawberry. The next one, the fruits now slightly bigger, are hexaploid strawberries. So they've got six copies of the chromosomes that this plant has two copies of. Here's the strawberries that you might grow in your garden. They're octoploid, they're 8N. And here are strawberries you might find in the supermarket. I couldn't find specific evidence about their ploidy level, but I'm betting that it's they're either decaploid or what's called dodecaploid, 10-ploid or 12-ploid. They're enormous. Now, tetraploidy, as we said in the previous lecture, can arise spontaneously by an error in mitosis, but it can also be induced by plant breeders using a chemical called colchicine. What colchicine does is it disrupts the microtubules. So the microtubules in mitosis actually disintegrate, and this therefore forces the um, checkpoint to abort the meiosis, and this tetraploid cell returns to the cell cycle. So this generates large numbers of tetraploid cells from diploid cells. Triploidy can also arise um, commonly by errors in meiosis, either in meiosis 1. Here we can see, like the error in mitosis aborting, that all of the chromosomes have wound up in one cell. This would most often happen if something went wrong with one side of the spindle. Or it can arise by an error in meiosis 2, where one of the gametes gets two sets of sister chromatids. It can also arise by mating errors. Um, one kind of mating error is a double fertilization, where an ovum is fertilized by two pollen grains. Um, this is very common in plants. For example, many apples become triploid in this way, um, generating triploid cells. Triploidy can also arise uh, by what would superficially look like a normal mating, um, one ovum and one pollen, if one of the participants is from a tetraploid parent and the other one is from a normal diploid parent. This again produces a triploid plant. Now, a big seeming disadvantage of triploidy is the triploid plants, or animals for that matter, are normally sterile. And that's because when you've got three sets of chromosomes, some of them are in ne inevitably going to remain unpaired in meiosis. And this is going to cause them to segregate unequally so that the meiosis will produce gametes that have different numbers of chromosomes and that typically have incomplete sets of chromosomes. These gametes are typically sterile, and that explains why if you are growing a triploid apple species, these are actually very common, they make, many of them produce very nice apples, but unless your apple tree is growing close to a diploid tree that produces lots of viable pollen, 
it's unlikely to set much fruit because its own pollen is mostly aneuploid. Now, breeders have exploited the sterility of triploid plants to produce seedless plants. Um, there's two examples here. The first is watermelon. There's normal watermelon seeds. And then here's a seedless watermelon that's triploid. Bananas, the wild diploid bananas, produce large nasty seeds, filling the fruit with seeds. The bananas that we buy that are sold commercially are all triploid and they don't have any seeds. A problem arises for the breeders. This is very nice for us. But it's a problem for the breeders because how do they propagate these plants so they can sell them to us? The watermelon breeders have solved this by using the um, mechanism of generating triploidy that I described earlier. Each generation, the watermelon breeders cross a tetraploid watermelon with a diploid watermelon generating seeds that are triploid that they can sell to watermelon growers and to us if we want to grow our own seedless watermelon. Banana breeders have a very different strategy. They're able to propagate bananas asexually by cutting so that these triploid plants can be propagated indefinitely without ever having to go through meiosis and generate seeds. This has created problems with new diseases that have arisen in bananas, breeders are finding it very difficult to breed for resistant bananas because they can't breed the bananas, they're sterile. Now, sterility has also been exploited in triploid animals. Although most triploid animals are non-viable, trout and salmon are reasonably viable and can be quite vigorous. This infertility that goes with being triploid is an advantage in a couple of situations. One is in lakes where sports fishermen like to come and fish. It's desirable to stock those lakes with nice, sporty, fighting fish, but these may not be native species, and you wouldn't want them to interbreed with native populations or to escape the lakes and take over a watershed. So instead, the lakes are stocked with triploid fish, which provide good sports fishing but can't escape. Triploidy is also exploited in farmed salmon. There's a great deal of concern that farmed salmon will escape and interbreed with the native salmon, especially if those farmed salmon have been genetically modified. But if the farmed salmon are also triploid, even if they escape, they can't breed, so they're not a threat to the ecosystem. Now, here's a question. We talked about the sterility of triploids. Would you expect this also to happen in tetraploids? And the answer is no. Tetraploids typically have normal fertility, and that's because each of their chromosomes, so they've got four, but they are able to form pairs um, in meiosis. So two sisters, two sisters, two sisters, two sisters. And so the chromosomes are all paired. They segregate normally in meiosis, producing um, euploid, diploid gametes, rather than producing the normal euploid, haploid gametes. Now, this ability of tetraploids to be fully fertile has been exploited by evolution. And I'm going to briefly describe one example from the plants called the brassicas. Now, there are three original species of brassica. They're closely related, but they have different numbers of chromosomes. We'll call their chromosomes type C, type B, and type A. And as we discussed in module 9, Hybrids that form between close relatives that have different numbers of chromosomes are normally sterile. So we would expect that the AB or AC or BC hybrids would all be infertile. In fact, they are, but we still see hybrids. But what we see is not those diploid hybrids, but tetraploid hybrids that have two copies of the B set and two copies of the C set, and similarly for the AC and AB hybrids. And these plants are fully viable, 
they're fertile, they've been given their own species names because, again, they don't form viable hybrids with other species. And you are actually quite familiar with at least some of these plants because many of them are plants that you would buy in the vegetable market. So if we just hide the species names and bring in the common names and some pictures, you'll see that several different species of mustard, both the seeds and the edible greens, are different species of either the original or the tetraploid hybrid plants. And down here, many familiar vegetables, cabbage, kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, rutabaga, Chinese cabbage, and turnips are all different combinations of these chromosomes, either in diploid plants or in tetraploid hybrid plants. So the reason that this happens is that tetraploidization restores fertility to the infertile diploid hybrid plants that we discussed in Lecture 9K. So when two different species form a hybrid, that hybrid is normal haploid gametes meat produces a diploid hybrid plant, that hybrid is infertile because its chromosomes can't pair. But when that hybrid accidentally undergoes tetraploidization, then that plant is able to produce fertile gametes and fertile offspring. So in species where form close relatives form diploid hybrids that are infertile, and then mitotic errors occasionally produce tetraploid plants from these diploid infertile plants, then we give rise to fertile tetraploids. And that's what you're eating when you eat cabbage or turnips or Brussels sprouts. So what we've done, we've talked about how polyploidy is common in plants and in plants that we're very familiar with. It's valuable to breeders because the plants are large and robust and breeders have developed ways to generate um, polyploid tetraploid plants that are robust but still fertile and to generate infertile triploids that are beneficial because they're seedless and then they've developed ways to propagate these seedless plants so they can continue to sell them to us. And tetraploids are fertile. Natural hybrids have sometimes exploited this as a way to restore fertility to what would otherwise be an infertile inter interspecific hybrid. Coming up next, we're going to begin talking about aneuploidy, about situations where organisms have incomplete sets of chromosomes. I hope to see you there.